Okay. Austin yeah. Council acknowledges the Borrigigal and Camaragal people as the traditional custodians of this land that I'm speaking from. We pay our respects to elders of the past and present and to those of the future and acknowledge their spiritual connection to country. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this author evening with Carly Findlay, presented by Mossman Library Service in celebration of International Day of People with Disability, which is coming up tomorrow, Friday, the 3rd of December. Thank you to Carly for her time and to Black Ink Books. I'm Therese Scott, Team Leader Library Experience. Carly Findlay, OAM, is the editor of Growing Up Disabled in Australia, and it is this book which we will be discussing tonight. There will be time for your questions at the end, either live, so it's raise your hand, or in the chat function. Carly is a writer, speaker, and appearance activist, and is the author of the memoir, Say Hello. She has been published in the ABC, The Guardian, The Age, The Sydney Morning Herald, CNN, and Vogue. And this author evening is now, I know, being recorded. So welcome to you, Carly. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you so much, Therese, and thank you for having me on Mossman Library and people coming here tonight. Um, I'm coming to you from Wurundjeri country. I'm in Nam, and I also pay my respects to Aboriginal elders past and present and um, acknowledge that this land um, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I always like to give a shout out to a, an Aboriginal writer because um, they've been telling stories on this land for over... 50, uh, over 60,000 years since the beginning of time. I want to let you know about this book, Flock, which is edited by Alan Van Nieuwen. It is an anthology. And um, the reason I'm mentioning it, not only because it's got amazing Aboriginal writers, but there's an Aboriginal disabled writer in there, Gail Kennedy, who is incredible. She's on Gadigal Country. Um, and she has written a chapter. And she's also in Growing Up disabled in Australia which we're talking about today and finally this one came um this is growing up in Australia which is an anthology of all the other anthologies from Black Ink um, and Gail is also in this book along with Tara Jean Winch and Stan Grant I believe who are also Aboriginal writers um I finally got my author copy today I'm in this as well um, it took ages I've been waiting a month I Gail rang me um, a couple of weeks ago to say Carly where's my author copy because the mail's taking so long she just got hers and I've waited ages anyway um, that is available from your library and so is Flock I'm guessing and Growing Up Disabled yes it is yep. excellent so go and um, read work by Aboriginal people go and borrow from the library or buy our books and um, thank you fantastic thanks I'm for ready your questions. questions and I've told my mum and dad that that it's on but they might not come but they might send them the recording absolutely sounds good to me so carly congratulations on your book growing up disabled in australia published by black ink books which you've Thank edited you. um you say in your very warm and welcoming introduction i hope that this book can be a friend to people who need it because it is a friend i needed when i was younger so was that your overarching principle when editing the over 360 submissions yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that disabled people don't often get a welcome when we become disabled. Um, if we're born disabled, often parents get a very um, sad, apologetic, sympathetic reaction from doctors and teachers and other people um, around them. Um, and if we acquire a disability, it's often seen as a tragedy. And so there really needs to be some sort of welcoming party. And Whenever I um, am introduced to a parent who has um, a child with ichthyosis, the skin condition I have, I always congratulate them and say, um, you know, welcome to the community and also that, you know, their baby's life will be really difficult, but it will be okay. There's a lot of hope. And so when I grew up, there was no books like this. Disability was represented really poorly, um, if at all. And so I think that this book would have really helped me identify as disabled when I was younger and also let me know that there weren't, um, that I wasn't alone, that there are other people out there, that disability isn't a bad word. Um, and that, um, you know, there's a whole community waiting and welcoming. Fantastic. In the introduction, you also mentioned that you took an intersectional approach when selecting mm -hmm. the work. And yep. I admit I didn't know what intersectional approach meant. So can you explain what that means and the difference that it actually made to the final work? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I feel like in literature, 
in media. There's a lot of white men in parliament. Um, hopefully they get voted out. Um, and I feel like that with disability, we often only see white disabled people in the media, um, in the sporting field. And it was really important to me that the book was made up of many types of disabled people, not only with diagnoses, but knowing that disabled people can be many things. Disabled people can be Aboriginal, they can be transgender, they can be women, men, trans people, non-binary people. Um, they can be mothers, they can be fathers, they can be parents, um, you know, they could be um, gay or queer or homosexual, whatever um, language they choose to use. Um, people from um, culturally, linguistically diverse backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, etc. So it's really important to me to have a vast range of experiences and also a vast range of people. And I know that when I, this, this book isn't the final, this is one of the proofs, so I don't have all of the, um, all of the chapter titles here, but I do know there's a very small percentage of men in the book and the men that we, we have are great, um, but there are mostly um, women and trans or non-binary people and there are quite a few um, people of colour, Aboriginal people as well um, it, and it was really important to me that we reach those communities. Um, the, other, the other community I wanted to mention is intellectually disabled people because often when we um, try and reach intellectually disabled people there are gatekeepers because the expectations are so low. And so it was important to me that we included um, as many as we could in the book. And one of the great things was in the 366 submissions, we got a bunch of um, submissions that were written at a conference for intellectually disabled people, at the Valid Conference. And we included, I think, two poems from that by Kerry Ann Messenger, who has Down syndrome. Um, and there's also Jane Rosengrave, who is a woman in in Melbourne, she's an Aboriginal woman as well. And um, there's been a few events that Jane has done with me um, and I, or, or that I put her forward for. And I know that for many, you know, the, the low expectations continue throughout um, lives, particularly of intellectually disabled people. And so it's meant a lot for me to be able to get people meaningful work out of this book, like doing library talks, like doing council talks. And Jane once um, did a talk earlier this year and she asked me about payment and I you know, gave her some advice and she asked me um, if it was $100 that she was getting. And I said, no, it was 500 and her life was changed. You know, like she said, I've never been paid that much in my life. And so that's really important that we ensure that disabled people get meaningful work and the book's giving people that. Um, can I ask, did you pitch the idea to publishers or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I wrote for um, Growing Up African in Australia. My mum is South African. And Maxine, Maxine Beniba Clark edited Growing Up African. And every time there was a new book, new book in the Growing Up series, um, announced people would say why not growing up disabled you know we need growing up disabled and so Maxine asked me to write for the book I think it would have been in around July 2018 um, and so that meant at that stage I had like two book deals within a year because I had I was still writing say hello and um, so she asked me to write that write for that rather and then I said to my agent Jacinta um, can we please pitch Growing Up Disabled at the same time? I literally sent her a text saying, I've been asked to write for Growing Up African. I want to pitch Growing Up Disabled too. And we had a meeting. And we, oh, actually, I put together a, a short proposal. It definitely wasn't as long as my memoir proposal. It was maybe two pages um, as, as opposed to my memoir proposal, which was like 6,000 words. And then, um, yeah, we did. Um, we pitched it, we had a meeting and, and it got in, but the embargoes mean, so I think I got the deal in maybe August of that year and the embargoes in publishing and in the arts are so long and I, we didn't announce it until Disability Day that year. So from August to December, I had to sit on that news and I told Maxine, obviously, and I, you know, thanked her and I also told Ben Law, who was calling for, um, at that time, just calling for stories for growing up queer and she, and um, one night on Twitter, I don't know how long out from the embargo, 
from the embargo release it was. But one night on Twitter, someone was asking about growing up disabled and Ben had tweeted, oh yeah, Carly's editing that. And I had to text him to say, take that down now because he gave that away. Anyway, um, yeah, so it was really exciting and have, really excited to announce it on Disability Day as well. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, and now growing up in Australia is out as well. I'm just moving away from the book momentarily. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I mean, mm -hmm. I knew you from Say Hello, so yeah, thank the you. groundbreaking memoir. So just a little bit more about yourself. Thanks. Um, I don't think Say Hello has ever been called a groundbreaking memoir before. Thank you. That's lovely. Um, so I grew up in Aubrey, um, in near Aubrey, in country New South Wales, and it's very hot, very hot in the summer, quite cool, cold in the winter. Um, my parents are, um, oh, there she is. There's my mum. <laughs> Hello, <Mom. laughs> um, my parents are my biggest fans I would say if you have a book out tell my mum she'll put it in your handbag and she'll tell in her handbag and tell everybody um, so yeah I grew up in Aubrey uh, in the 80s and 90s and it was hard I would say it was hard being one of the only um, multicultural families I think in the little town we had I, I grew up in a tiny town that had about 500 people there was a lot of migrants from Germany there but not many mixed race people or um, you know mixed race families certainly not many black people and um, so people would whisper your mum's black as if I didn't know and I'm red as if I didn't know I found that really hard um, and it was also quite re a religious town and my um, I would often be blamed um for well my parents would be blamed for being black and white and that's why I got my condition which I don't understand because you know um genetics anyway um mum and dad spent a lot of time instilling you know self-confidence in me but they also spent a lot of time taking me to hospital uh in Sydney in Wagga in Aubrey or to the doctors in Wagga in Aubrey and at that time it was you know a long time away from home for, for both of them um, and also a long way to travel because the highways weren't you know the freeways weren't um, as developed then and so you know I'd been hospital for a week or two at a time in Melbourne um, because there wasn't a great dermatologist there in Aubrey um, so yeah you know my life was a lot of hospitals and specialists and I just found that I found that quite comforting I guess because I didn't have a great school life and so it was like the people at hospital were more friendly and understood me more than my um, peers at school um, and I always wanted to be a journalist I always wanted to be a writer probably from when I was maybe I don't know 12 when I realized I didn't want to be a doctor anymore I wanted to be a dermatologist that's actually what what I always wanted to be when I was a kid and then I changed my mind I realized I'd have to study a long time I also had like I mean I think he meant well but I had a really discouraging dermatologist who said you shouldn't be a dermatologist because they'd be confused about who's the doctor and who's the patient um you know saying that today would be quite discriminatory um and I also realized I would probably be 36 years old or something by the time I would qualify and that just seemed too long uh so I wanted to be a writer but then Aubrey there was no kind of study available there you know there was no kind of um uh what's it called um tertiary study in journalism I think my mum's on not on mute um <laughs> maybe Teresa put her on mute I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. Um, anyway, uh, I, yeah, so I studied, um, I went, I went to university and I had to study this really boring degree, which was in, in um, Wodonga. Uh, yeah, I studied a Bachelor of E-commerce. It was a business degree. I used to be good at a lot of things at school and I was not good at e-commerce when I finally, you know, got to uni because it was a lot of accounting, a lot of economics. And then, um, the other thing that happened just after school, just as school was finishing, is I started work at Kmart and that just changed my life as well. So uni and Kmart just, you know, gave me a whole new insight into people. I had friends for the first time, you know, friends on the same level as me and, um, you know, of different ages and different experiences. And that was great. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I did enjoy uni. I enjoyed the social, there's my dad. I enjoyed the social part of uni and I enjoyed the... Um, <laughs> embarrassing now <laughs> I enjoyed the social part of uni and I enjoyed the um social part of Kmart and um yeah so then I moved to Melbourne when I was 21 and um I got to study journalism because um 
that was available to me then. I did a graduate program um, with, the, with the government and then I, on the side I studied and, and I started writing more and I started writing about me probably in about 20, 2009, I would say I started writing a bit more about me. And then, yeah, I've been writing professionally ever since then, really, for um, different news outlets. I wrote for the, a government website to start with and then the ABC ramp up and then, yeah, The Age and lots of different places. So that's been good and speaking. And I so I used to work for the government and then I realised I just didn't want to do that anymore because it was, you know, not not quite discriminatory um, outwardly, but certainly covertly. And, um, yeah, I just decided I didn't want to do it anymore. So I made the made the jump in 2016 and I've never looked back I did take leave without pay in case I'd have to go back but I didn't so that was great and um that meant that I could um yeah I, I work part-time now at Melbourne Fringe so um I like having that income I like working in the arts and I also do things like this writing and speaking and when I finished at the government um I made a huge list which is like my pin note on my iPad um iPhone and it had all the ways to make money and some of them were talks like this but there was like writing a book um which I've done two of now oh, and I will will write another next year I think a kids book I got some funding just recently to write a kids book um and I will um yeah so all of those things I've done so many different things since I've left like speaking writing tv work um produced a fashion show working in the arts it's been great I love it I love being busy although right now it is very busy and I can't wait for uh maybe the 10th of December when no the 15th I think my last event is this week I've got I think eight speaking events and then two media things Goodness, you'll need to put your feet up after that. Cannot wait. Yeah, I got actually outsourced. It's my birthday next week and I actually oh. outsourced the job of looking for a venue to my mum because I left it too late and um, I was all a bit worried. Anyway, got she and a friend got it sorted today. So I'm very excited and very thankful. Um, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Just back to the book, Growing Up Disabled mm -hmm. in Australia. What I loved about it was that it really is a dip in, dip out book. So you can start yeah. anywhere. You can stop anywhere. And I also love the inclusion of poetry and the illustrations. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was important to me. It's important because I think for some disabled people and some other, you know, anyone really, especially maybe if English is their second language or, um, you know, if, if they're dyslexic or have a, another learning disability, they might not want to sit down and read a whole book at a time. It might be daunting to them. People might not have time. Um, and also people communicate in different ways. And so there's lots of different types of um, stories in there, you know, in poetry form, in um, long form and illustrations and also interviews as well. There are some people who um, aren't natural writers or um, communicate better in an interview style. And so... And there are those two, and that was really important to me, I think, to show the different communication processes. And you might see Jane Rosengrave. I sat down with her and interviewed her for an hour or so, and it was really important to me to keep the way that she talks in there. And so there's a lot of dolls and oh yes in there, and um, she she calls everyone doll and blondie. <laughs> Yes, there were quite a few stories where it was based on an interview you had with the author. Yeah, yeah. I I I interviewed Isis Holt because we didn't have um, a Paralympian um, in the selection, so I I had known her parents through work, and so I asked I asked them if I could get in touch, and so I sent the interview questions, and um, she'd done them. I don't actually can't remember if it's in interview form or if it's just a um, essay type, but I had sent her the questions, and she email me back in, in two hours she was so efficient and it was written so great and Jordan still John also was interviewed but not by me he was interviewed by a professor at the university um in Perth yeah and I had to his his interview was very long I don't know how long it was but it took a very long I think it might have been 10,000 words and I had to distill it to 3,000 so it was very long it was good is there a particular story that really resonates with you or that just yeah. really surprised you like you were knocked you out 
Yeah, there were so many. I mean, I can't have favourites because they're all my favourites. That's true. But, <laughs> but there were a few that I really related with. I really related to Elle Gibbs' story because Elle has um, a severe skin condition as well. Um, and I thought that was, I really related to her time in hospital and sort of the d- denial of severity. Um, I also really related to Belinda Down's story. Belinda has a facial difference. So I saw like related to that experience. Um I really loved the way Olivia Musket had talked about all the different people she'd meet in her life through those funny letters. That was really great. Um, I, I narrated the audiobook as well. I wasn't supposed to do it, but um, COVID and access reasons meant that um, Kate Hood, who's an actor, she couldn't do it. So she was supposed to do it. I ended up doing it at last minute. And um, it was sort of the first time I'd read the book after reading it. A while ago because it was supposed to be out in June last year and the pandemic you know put it um put it back and so it was like reading it again for the first time and there were so many stories in there that I was just so surprised or feeling warm and um, like Sam Drummond's story about the dog you know disability features but it is essentially about a dog that was just beautiful and um the poem I really like the way Jess Walton's poem their poem at the end um it's just such a lovely piece of joy and about joy in the body so that was lovely all of them are great all of them yeah the one that well not as not so much resonated with me but kind of Uh my ears was Fiona Murphy's Wide for Sound because I just read her memoir The Shape of Sound Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can you and she lives in Melbourne too doesn't she no she's in New South Wales now yeah I think she's in um in the west um out of West Sydney, I think. She, um, yeah, her, her story is in the shape of sound. I remember um, having to, so when you, when you publish an anthology or a book, a, a novel or a memoir, you have to get permission to use things from other books if you're going to do that. And I remember getting an email via the publisher from Fiona's publisher to give me a heads up that her chapter in the book, because it was written before, the shape of sound would be in the shape of sound so yeah that's I love that cross promotion and the same with me with growing up African the same stories in say hello and I think in growing up Australian another story from say hello um anyway her book her piece is amazing it is about it's very visual about wearing the glasses with the um Mm. hearing aids and and sort of being in denial about being deaf and coming to accept the deaf community and learn Auslan and just become such a great advocate I really loved hers and she's such a great advocate for writers and um in the publishing industry as well and the shape of sound is a beautiful memoir I got to read it a few I I can't remember maybe the start of the year and endorse it and then um when we were doing media for this book we did media on the same day uh, on the same show studio 10 and she got to promote her book as well as this one and yeah she's a beautiful writer she just writes so well and she's a very good um uh critic as well she's done a lot of critical uh critiques of disabled work yeah um carly what do you hope readers will take away from the book um oh, I hope that people will read it and realize disability isn't a bad thing that it's so diverse that disability is diverse and it's um it's intersectional you know that we are more than our disability and lots of different things all at once um I really hope that they will um the what else would I hope I hope that they um recommend it to others um I hope, uh, and, and I must say, in support of authors, recommending to others doesn't mean lending it to others. It means like recommending it to buy or giving it as a present because it's so important that authors get the get the money. No, I'm not saying that for my benefit. I'm saying it for all authors' benefits. Mm. Um, I also recommend that young people read it. I recommend that young disabled people read it, that they can find that they're not alone. And the other thing I really hope, and I saw a lot of in the book, um is I got asked this actually for the media that will be out tomorrow night um what sort of stuff have I have I noticed that's still occurring you know like throughout history um has have things for disabled people improved and I noticed that like in the education sector fields and also the medical fields things are very much the same we've got people in the book who are teens and we've got people who are in their 70s and 
the experiences are very similar, you know, especially in the education field and in the medical ableism. And I, so I really hope medical people um, will read this when they have to, um, you know, tell a parent of a child's diagnosis, they'll know that they don't have to break it to them with an apology or sympathy. Um, and I really hope that teachers read it as well to learn. I mean, I get a lot of, I think there are a lot of people who are very well-meaning in, in these parts of, um, you know, education and medicine, but also can be quite ableist in their delivery. And so, you know, to raise the expectations across those fields would be great and to change that so that, you know, in five years we can look at some of the stories that were told in there, you know, like Chantal Bongiovanni's and Jess, um, uh, oh, I can't remember Jess's surname, um, because I think she wanted a pseudonym and a pseudonym's in here. Anyway, Jess, um, or Jess Marshall, she didn't want a pseudonym after the um, proof. Um, you know, both Chantal and Jess's were stories of ableism that they experienced in schools. And I really hope that, you know, when we read this book in five years time, that has passed and we, we, that, that's in history. Uh, what's your next project? Um, well, I'm gonna go on a six week holiday. Oh, nice. That's my next project. Um, we get time off Melbourne Fringe. And so, um, because we haven't had any holidays this year, I get to have extra holidays. Um, we all get four weeks and I'm taking an extra two. And then uh, I'm gonna rest then. Um, uh, next year, I wanna write uh, the kids book. I got the grant from Maribyrnong Council to write a kids book to work with um, an author. So I'm working with Nikki Greenberg, who is a great disability ally. I actually met Nikki um, not through writing, but through roller skating. She is a roller skater. I am a new roller skater. She's very good at it. If you follow her skating on Instagram, you'll be very impressed. Um, and so I'm doing a kids book probably around, I don't know, five to eight-year-olds I don't know I don't know much about children so I feel like that might be a big age age range or something anyway um so I'm going to do that I want to finally do a podcast um, as well I I had um some funding to do one and I haven't because of the pandemic and busyness but I really want to just make that make like five stories of um disabled women of color because I feel like they're so underrepresented um I also want to do some more tv work if that comes by so yeah, but on my holiday, that's all I'm going to focus on from me. I think the, the 15th of, or the 17th of December are my last days at work. Lovely. And I'm, like, <laughs> I'm really tired. Mm -hmm. I've got something in the media tomorrow, actually. As I said, I've got um, a story coming out, which will be in the Urban List. I think that might be out tonight. The editor messaged me to say he'll put, well, they'll put it up tonight and also um, the project as well tomorrow. Great. Busy times, but looking forward to a holiday absolutely yes yeah. I want to learn how to roller skate backwards and I also <laughs> want to learn how to um make more things in my kitchen aid yeah okay. I want to do some leisure excellent <laughs> this, everyone get ready for your questions this is just oh, yeah. the last question <laughs> comment to you here at Mossman Council for the past few weeks we've been asking our community in the lead up to International Day of People with Disability what inclusion means to them Mm -hmm. And this was our Voices for Inclusion project. And we asked people living with disability, a family member, a carer or a member of the community, what it means to them in the form of, we asked people to write in, to shoot a short video, draw a picture. I'm wondering, Carly, can you share with us tonight, if Mossman Council had asked you that question in the last few weeks, what it means to you? Yeah, it's about making sure disabled people, all people, um, are thought of at the very beginning of the planning process and that it's not an afterthought to provide access in any form. So, um, you know, making sure application processes are accessible, making sure that the workplace is accessible for everybody. Um, I read out a tweet earlier today, I'm just gonna find it, um, around how um, we've got to stop thinking about accessibility, um, like the need to disclose disability to create accessibility. We really have to stop thinking about that and providing accessibility for all. So this tweet is by Elle Gibbs, who is Blunt Shovels on Twitter. And Elle says, instead of asking only disabled people to disclose their disability when it might not be safe to do so, why don't employers ask everyone what their access needs and workplace adjustments are? Normalize that everyone needs flexibility and the tools to do their job. And that was in response to some of the comments made um, in the hearing 
around employment at the Disability Royal Commission. Um, you know, we see dietary needs being asked, but why not ask about, you know, caring responsibilities? Do you have a child? Do you have an elderly parent that you need to care for? Do you have a dog? You know, do you have um, a need to leave early? Do you need to work late into the night because that suits you? Do you need job sharing? All of that stuff should be asked and we shouldn't have to be disclosing why we need them as well. And I think the pandemic's really proven that we can work from anywhere. And um, that, you know, it is successful to do stuff from home and online and all of that. So, mm. yeah. Good Thank question. You. Thank you so much, Carly. We've got the floor open to all of the people attending this evening. So if you'd like to, mm -hmm. I'll just let you know some messages, Carly. Natalia mm -hmm. says there were two awesome books, Carly, such game changers. Thank and you. also in the um, Growing Up Disabled, Jordan's piece was absolutely brilliant. That's from Natalia. Yeah. It was really good. And I think I think actually um, if people um, haven't read it already, I think there might have been a, an excerpt on SBS. Um, I'll just find that for you. Um, his piece was really great in acknowledging like the role of his family. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions? I've got half an hour and I don't have any questions prepared, but I probably can think of some if no one else has. I'm in the chat. I'm waiting for the questions. Or you can raise your hand if you'd yep. like to speak directly. Yep. Just unmute yourself. Don't be shy. You can ask me anything. Anything about writing? Anything about... Um, oh, thank you for that. Ability? Anything? Anything? Hey, Carly, it's Natalia. Hello. Thanks Hello. for doing this talk. Um, really Hello. lovely to hear from you. Um, I know there's heaps happening tomorrow for International Day. Yep. I just wondered what your kind of um, top picks or recommendations were for oh. events that are going on throughout the day. Yeah, good question. So Caitlin Blythe is doing Just a Spoonful podcast um, and Caitlin is interviewing, um, I'm just grabbing Caitlin's um, details now to tell you what time it is. Caitlin is um, interviewing two growing up disabled contributors actually, um, Jess Walton, who wrote the poem at the end of the book. And also they've got a book out called Stars in Her Eyes, Their Eyes Now. Um, and also Alistair Baldwin, whose piece is very funny. His, is, uh, his piece is about the um, horses, the writing for the disabled. Um, the, the, show is Friday 3rd of December um seven dollars I believe it cost I think it's online but I don't know what time hang on um so that is my pick there for an event it is at night time I believe because I said I wasn't sure if I could go because I might be asleep um I know that um the ABC are going to run a whole heap of things. Um, Friday, the seventh of uh, sorry, the third of December, seven pm to eight pm is just a spoonful. Um, actually, the I believe the event might be at the Wheeler Centre um, and then recorded. Anyway, seven pm Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Um, yeah, the ABC I know are doing a heap of things. Um, I know some friends who have done some, you know, articles. They did that call out for, you know, writers and journalists and things for the ABC. Um, I did see, if you want to catch up, Naz Campanella was hosting Hack tonight um, on Triple J. And I believe there's a podcast and there's actually been heaps of articles out this week as well, which has been really great to see. Um, I know that um, Naz wrote that really great piece on parenting um, and also becoming a parent as well. Um, I'm just looking through my social media now because I shared a bunch of them. Um, the other thing is um, I'm doing a thing that might be public. I think it's with Jen, Jen Yu tomorrow. I can't remember what time, I'm sorry. But if you go onto Jen Yu's website, you probably find it. Um, oh, the other thing I recommend is... Um, I'll grab the link, um, 3CR, and they always do such a great job. Pauline Vituna is the um, host or the producer, rather. She is um, organising the Disability Day 12-hour um, broadcast tomorrow, and that's from 7 o'clock. Um, I'll put it in the, in the chat. Uh, it's going to be amazing. It's mostly led by... Um, people of colour and Aboriginal people uh, and 
it's got, I'll tell you now, I'm just on the website. Um, it's got a bunch of things around disability justice. It's around, um, what else, pride, uh, grounding disability justice schedule. That is what the theme is. Um, there's some, uh, Jane Rosengrave is going to be on there. As I said earlier, she's amazing. Um, there is also um, a U Ubuntu Voices, which is um, giving voice to the local African community. Um, and there is also um, a Free Palestine event, busting the binaries around um, uh, LGBTIQA plus people. Um, there's a, a, a podcast with chronically chilled the other thing I saw was the um oh Aki shared it before I can't remember what it, what I think it's like disability sport and recreation and it's like a festival an online festival tomorrow um yeah so lots of things on I recommend checking out the media um probably the ABC I'm writing for Urban List as I said um I reckon there's going to be lots of lots of things because people are getting into it it seems finally I will be interested to see how our allies will um, include us because I feel that uh, a disability day is often lacking when it comes to that and you know there's so much talk around other you know days diversity days but we're often forgotten so we'll see um, yeah I hope that awesome was thank you very yeah. much that's if really helpful else, oh no worries Natalia if anyone else knows of anything put it in the comments Um, oh, and the project's doing a thing. I don't know whether they're doing a whole, like a whole episode dedicated, but um, they're inter they interviewed me and there's going to be a um, uh, another two people that are involved as well. Yeah, I don't know whether any of my other events are public, but I think the Gen U one is public because they keep on advertising it to me. Like I keep on getting sponsored posts about it. And I think that um, there are going to be other speakers as well at that, at that event. Yeah, I'll find it now. Does anyone else have any questions? Because I have lots of time and it would be great to talk to you. Don't be shy. Questions, anyone? This is a chance. <laughs> Look, I can keep going. Yeah, if you want to. <laughs> <here> again. Thank <laughs> you. Sir. Um, look, I love the piece that you shared on LinkedIn earlier today. I know you share a fair bit on there. Mm -hmm. So it was the one um, from, I think it was Daniela yep. or Danielle on ABC. Yeah. Um, just talking about how many people in the community have their disability kind of denied and are not considered disabled enough and I know you've spoken about this as well mm. um, and for me reading your book Say Hello was one of the first times where I really identified as disabled um, because you know government has this really strict criteria um, and I guess my question is well firstly I'd just love to hear you talk about that a little bit more because yeah. I think it's really important and you know I, I wonder if if that's ever going to change or if there's anything we can be doing to change it? Like, do we just need to be voicing it more and, you know, advocating for more? Yeah. It just seems yeah. really hard. Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so I'll find the, or if you can find the piece, Natalia. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Um, yeah, that's a really great question. So I didn't identify as disabled for a very long time because I didn't see anyone like me with ichthyosis. But I also found, like, I didn't see... I didn't see disability in a positive way either. And I didn't know that I could be disabled because I didn't know that there was such a spectrum of disability. You know, I thought it was quite limited. And it was only when I met other disabled people that I found um, my people and also found that I um, had lots of barriers in common, even though we had different ty types of diagnoses. And so that was really interesting to find other people and just finally like, oh, wow, yeah, we both have these, you know, things in common like lots of specialists lots of time in hospital etc anyway um I feel like it is really prescription you know the government's list of disabilities on that list from the DSS is really really um 
prescriptive but also prohibitive around who gets support. Um, there is... I know when, when I talk to people with ichthyosis in the community and their parents, you know, they often ask, am I eligible for the NDIS or am I eligible for the DSP? And um, I think there are some types of, types of ichthyosis that are and some that aren't. One of the things I really struggle with, and I just, I think we don't talk about this enough, but I'm also mindful of not talking about this too much because I recognise my privilege, is that I don't feel like working disabled people get any support. And it's very hard like it has been really hard for me when, um, especially when I was younger and new in my job and earning quite a less amount of money, you know, as, as I am now and not being able to get a healthcare card because I'm over the threshold and still having to pay for those um, prescriptions. And, you know, like just because I have a job, it doesn't mean it's any less costly to stay alive and I know we're not in America I heard this story from a friend actually in America who's also got ichthyosis and she said that because she didn't have health insurance through her work she couldn't get access to her cream which is just like this like Vaseline but on prescription for five months and I'm like what what did you do you know how how did you survive because it's just too expensive for them to live so I absolutely acknowledge my privilege of working and also acknowledge my privilege of um not being you know ha having a, having a job and not being in America but I feel like we need to get more support for those who work because at the moment it's just assumed that we can afford everything but then you know, like if you need a modified car, it's often not covered on the NDIS. If you need to use, you know, like lots of different prescription medications, it's very expensive. So there's that. And, you know, not all disabled people get access to the NDIS. Not, ev not everyone gets access to the DSP. And also you keep on having to prove that you're disabled in everything, like in the DSP and the NDIS. And just this week, Linda Reynolds, I don't know why she's minister for the NDIS. She seems to hate disabled people she said that you know she didn't expect us to to it to be a lifetime thing you know as though disabled people are just going to recover so I think in short we have to make sure that we keep talking about this keep making a noise keep being visible you know the more that we're not in the media the the more that we're forgotten I guess and but yeah there is that way and and also like I feel like disabled people, some disabled people, police other disabled people in how we're doing disability. And so that is really hard. I don't know whether you saw my Twitter last week, but I had this ridiculous experience where Tara Moss, who's a Canadian um, writer, and she's newly disabled. She's probably been um, you know, experiencing chronic pain for a few years now and has recently identified as disabled and a part of the disability community. And she had this great photo of her in a wheelchair with her arms up like this, saying that her um, she hasn't been able to get to the gym during the pandemic and her arms have formed muscles because of her wheelchair use. And there are a number of disabled people who were, you know, telling her off about how awful her tweet was, you know, how ableist it was and they're telling her how to do disability. And I went and de defended Tara from someone. Um, and then not only were they saying that Tara wasn't disabled enough, but they were saying I am and that I'm a fraud and that I'm faking it and that I don't, have a, I don't even have disability written in my bio on Twitter. And um, it was just such an odd, odd thing to say and the policing of disability by other disabled people particularly has to stop and because it makes people too scared to come out it makes people too scared to be part of the community and to feel like they belong and that their pain is valid and you know that disability is such a broad spectrum yeah and do we have any other questions you seem to have a lot Natalia it's good Yes, I'm really happy just to use this as like a one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> like, no, if, if, yeah, if no one else wants to ask. <laughs> but I will wait to see if anyone else has anything yeah. first. Anyone is welcome. What's yours, Natalia? Okay, sure. Um, Carly, I think that's a really interesting point. And, um, you know, you mentioned that, uh, sorry, the point that you made about people in the disability community policing each other. Um, and right. you mentioned there were, you know, a few people doing some work with the ABC and I was one of them. I had a story come out um, last Friday. Congratulations. Um, sorry? Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, but I guess like I was just terrified in the lead up to that story coming out. 
um, because I was so worried about, uh, you know, I'm new to writing um, and I'm relatively new to disability. I acquired my disability about five years ago and I didn't identify until a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was just really scared that I was going to get backlash from the community about some of the things that I'd written Um, Mm. and I guess that's, uh, I just think that's an awful thing that happens in the community. Mm -hmm. I really hope that it doesn't, well, I know, I know what happens and I know it will continue Mm -hmm. to, but I wish that was something that would stop, um, basically. So yeah, I don't have a question in there for you. I don't think. Oh, no, I absolutely agree. And I think that the fear is absolutely real. And um, I'm going to post Natalia's amazing article featuring Prue Hawkins oh, in there um, in the chat. Um, yeah, I mean, I was I was terrified when I was writing my book. Um, yeah. I got, there was a couple of things that happened. I lost a heap of friends. I lost a heap of friends for not doing disability right. Um, I remember someone very prominent saying to me early when I got my book deal and I also signed to a speaking agent around the same time and um they said you, you can either be to say like a disability activist or you can be mainstream but you can't be both and from then I just had friends you know drop off and when I confronted them about it which was online because a lot of people that I know in the disability community are online and online friendships are real friendships except when they turn shit and um yeah um they said that you know I could only do that and I was sort of noticing a a real kind of silence so I confronted them sort of late in the year that was sort of mid-year when that happened around the time I got my book deal and late in the year I left it a few months and and asked them and um, there was so much gaslighting you know and I remember saying to my publisher and my agent I I don't want to I don't know if I want to release this book. You know, people are telling me how I need to do disability. The other thing was, you know, I got emails from people in the disability community telling me how I should write the book. Um, And actually with growing up disabled, I mean, I kind of expected this, but I had a lot of people thinking that they were, they were in the book just by way of submitting and I had to you know manage those expectations I had a lot of people remind me that they're not in the book um, since the book came out even though the you know the the short list long list whatever the you know selection list was announced back in 20 20 uh 19 in December so you know um when the book got released I had people asking me that um so that was still weird but I've learned how you have to find the right people. You know, you have to find the right people, trust them, really be discerning on Twitter. You know, if someone tells you that this person in the community is harmful, believe them, believe them and uh, watch what they do, see what they do. It's pretty obvious most of the time. And so, um, you know, believe them, find your people. There's so many good people out there. And, um, you know, the writing groups, I run the disability arts community and the disabled and chronically ill writers, and they're all really great. The Freelance Jungle is really great as well for writing um, support and diversity in Australian media. That's really great run by Anna. Um, but, you know, finding those people is really important and also not buying into that kind of policing. I have been thinking though, how do we call out or call in bad behavior in the disability community without turning into those bullies like how do we do that because you know I see people that I'd want to sort of say hey that wasn't quite right and even you know talking to me if if someone wants to raise something with me how do they do that without turning into one of those bullies and I don't know how to solve that yet but I want to think about that more and write on it because you know I've seen some pretty yucky stuff that disabled people do it doesn't make make them entirely bad people but how do we talk about that publicly without making people scared you know in the way we've been yeah I hope that answers your question yeah absolutely that's a great that was an awesome answer and you know I think it's partly I don't know I always try to and certainly in your writers group that's such a supportive environment that I always make the note of being really open to feedback from people in that group because yeah yeah, I want to keep learning and um, I know that everyone there is really respectful and it's a safe Mm -hmm. place so thanks for running that group too. I started the disability arts community group because um, there was a group that wasn't respectful and I'm just like I don't want to be a part of this anymore so I started my own and I think we probably got more members to be honest if you you know if you can't find it then create it yeah I'm just posting the um, groups in the chat if you're interested in disabled. 
Do we have any more questions? We've got like four minutes, four minutes, six minutes, six minutes. Any more questions, anyone? Natalia, do you have one last question? <laughs> I do. Did <laughs> <laughs> you come with a list? Everyone else is welcome to, but I think you're on a roll, Natalia. Am I? Okay. Yeah. My last question is probably pretty straightforward. So um, mm -hmm. I have only just started writing this year and mm -hmm. I would just love your recommendations for, you know, it, I don't know, the, your favourite publications or favourite editors that you work with who are oh. really supportive of the stuff yeah. that you do. That's a great question. Um, so Refinery29 have been pretty good for me. Um, they have just launched an Australian version of their like Australian branch of their um, publication and they're based, like, I think they're based in America. It's a young person's um, publication though. I feel really old writing for it. Um, the Age has been good. The Guardian, although I haven't written for The Guardian in a while, but The Guardian's apparently great. I think um, Comment is free or the Lifestyle section would be pretty good. Um, I just wrote something for The Age a few weeks ago and um, they were great to work with, but Dan it was on the pandemic and Daniel Andrews released restrictions and so my article was no longer relevant because he he changed the restrictions sooner than we thought and so that didn't get published and I think that's the nature of things it's like you have to accept that you know not everything's going to get published and I meant to write something else but it's been too busy I you know and really it's fine um the other place that's pretty good is um look and this is really contentious so at the start of the year I got asked to write for the Australian and in my journalism studies, I was always told to read like both sides of the um, political spectrum. It doesn't mean I support both sides. I'm clearly very left, but also the Murdoch publications as problematic as they are. Um, my book is with HarperCollins, which is through Murdoch. They've been great. Um, so HarperCollins are great at publishers. Um, but every time I've written for News Corp, they've been really great. The News Limited people have been great. Um, Kidspot, um, uh, the, the Australian have been great. They pay, they pay on time, they pay well. Um, so they've been very good. Um, I think that though you have to be prepared for backlash if you are going to write for somewhere that is contentious. Um, I heard that what's it called is good, but I can never get in. Mianjin, I don't know how to reach Mianjin. It's like you have to send a telegram or something. I'm not sure. I've heard they're great, but I don't know. I don't know how to get, get to them. Um, who else? I don't know. I, I don't write for the media a heap. But oh, so Black Ink have been great to work for. They've been very collaborative. I also recommend if there's call outs for things like the SBS Writers Competition or the Emerging Writers Competition or, um, you know, any anthologies, um, give that a go. Put your, you know, put your feelers out there. It's a really good way to get noticed. And I'm just going to Google um, a couple of years ago when we were calling for, um, when we were calling for uh, the anthology submissions, we, Danielle, my agent, so I've got two agents at Jacinta Damaze, Danielle and Jacinta, um, Danielle suggested I do this um, like a uh, info session on writing for anthologies. And so um, we did this writing for anthology session. And even though it is about growing up disabled, it's really useful in um you know answering calls and um you know answering calls to anthology call outs and how to structure your piece and how to get feedback also getting feedback's really good making sure that you don't give up writing um oh, no that didn't work making sure you don't give up writing just because you get one rejection like I get a lot of people that say oh, well, I'm never going to write for you again um, or, you know, I'm never going to do this again. And I just, the industry is too small to do that. So it's really important to just keep going. Also, if you get rejections, be nice. Be nice to the person who's rejecting you. I can't tell you how many rude emails I get from people who are, you know, there's an infinite, finite, sorry, number of, you know, funds and programs and places and, we can't give money to everyone, but gosh, be nice. Know that the industry's small and know that feedback is 
for the most part when I do it is caring and you know I know that not every editor has time to give feedback either so yeah I hope that helps but yeah apply for anthology call outs please they're great look we'll have to wrap awesome. up thank you sorry Natalia thank you so much you. for all those really good tips as well um Carly thank you for everyone for joining us tonight and I hope tomorrow right it's going to be a really busy day for you but yep. I'm sure you'll enjoy it Thank you. Have a good time, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming, Nicole, so Sophie, Tracy, Natalia, Therese, and my mum and dad uh, for, <laughs> for coming. That was really fun. I'm going to write a piece for Disability Day now, and I'm going to go to sleep. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Bye.